<clears throat> Hello and welcome to uh, What's the Bug Deal? Integrated Pest Management for Collections, Facilities, and Other Museum Personnel hosted by Collections Managers Committee, better known as CMC, and presented by Krista D.C. Quinn. I'm today's host, Alex Freeman, the Executive Director of the Texas Association of Museums. A little bit about TAM, um, if you're not familiar. Um, our mission is to strengthen the Texas museum community through commu uh, collaborations, connections, professional development, and advocacy. And TAM is really for uh, museums, art centers, historic homes and sites, children's museums, community cultural centers, zoos, science centers, university galleries, and any institution, especially in Texas, that exists to exhibit and interpret the historic, cultural, artistic, ethnic, or scientific heritage of mankind. You can see we have a very big tent here at TAM and, and who we consider museums, not just museums, but all these, these fine, uh, fine groups. The core of our uh, professional development program is our annual meeting. Um, and so I do want to explain, we, got, we did a shift in our annual meeting. We were gonna try to a hybrid event, but the, those darn vaccines weren't rolling out at the, at the rate that we wanted to. So we we're gonna go online. Um, so uh, this year, you don't have to put your hard pants on to take part. Uh, we'll be opening up registration soon, uh, but here you'll see the dates are April 12th, 13th, 16th. Um, we're wrapping up our, our big um, uh, schedule at a glance and, and getting our sessions uh, in place. So I want to, uh, to highlight that. Now on to uh, today's program. We are joined by Leslie Ochoa, CMC's Counselor at Large Technology, the Witty Museum's Director of Collections, and Krista D.C. Quinn, uh, the Collections Manager at the University of Illinois Spurlock Museum. We'll turn it over to Leslie. All right, thank you so much. Um, as Alex said, I serve as the Officer at Large for Technology for the Collection Managers Committee, or CMC, which is an affinity group of TAM. Um, we began in 1988 and we serve Texas collection managers, registrars and other museum professionals to learn and promote the highest standards in the field um, like other affinity groups for TAM. And I'm here today to introduce Krista D.C. Quinn. Krista is the collections manager at the University of Illinois Spurlock Museum. She has over 30 years of experience in museum collections preservation. She is a certified technician of general use pesticides in Illinois a certified mold remediation worker and our IPM program at the Spurlock was the first museum to earn Green Shield certification. She teaches museum collection preservation in the Graduate School of Information Science at the University of Illinois, serves as a faculty associate of Ontario's, uh, Ontario's Willowbank School of Restoration Arts and is an instructor at the Center for Collections Care at Beloit College and is a peer reviewer for the AAN MAP program. Her book, Fundamentals of Museum IPM 2019, has been downloaded over 672 times in 48 countries. So please join me in welcome, welcoming Krista. Thank you so okay. much for joining us, Krista. I'm good. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. So here we go. Can you see it? Can you see my presentation? Hello? Yes, we can. It's okay. in uh, presentation mode right now. Excellent. So you can see my, you know, the title, my university, that's my museum and everything. Um, it's the presentation mode. So it's showing um, all the different slides in your um, oh, text. Weird. Okay. Let me stop the share then for a second. I'm sorry. Okay. I don't understand why it's doing that. Um, so let's try it again. Sure. I'll let you get set up. Um, and just so you know, this webinar is being recorded. If you have a question, uh, you may add it to the chat box here. If your question relates to a specific part of the presentation, um, then we will um, we'll try to save some time in there. So looks like, Krista, looks like you're good to go on the, in the presentation. So now you can see it. Okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is my museum. We're at the University of Illinois. This is showing a really nice spring day. And I am really excited to talk to you about fundamentals of museum IPM. Um, a quick and brief history of integrated pest management. Pests, oh, and just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I can't see the chat, 
But Leslie will be reading any questions that come up during my presentation. Feel free to write them in the, in the chat. Am I correct, Leslie? And then I can answer them as we go through, but there'll also be time at the end as well. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Pests have always presented a major threat to artifact preservation. Since the 18th century, museums have used pesticides to control these harmful invaders. In fact, it used to be considered common practice for museums to treat artifacts and collections areas with toxic chemicals, such as arsenic and mercury. Until the 20th century, pesticides were used indiscriminately and often, were the, uh, and often the source of pest infestations were never found. As a result, artifacts that were treated became contaminated or damaged. Many of the pesticides that were standard pest management practice, you know, that were used at that time are now illegal due to health risks they pose to people and the environment and non-target -tar species. Traces of arsenic and mercury can still be found on some of these objects today. In 1979, a presidential directive uh, mandated that a new strategy called Integrated Pest Management, or IPM, be adopted on federal properties to address the outgoing environmental health concerns surrounding pesticide use. It fell on the National Park Smart Service and the Smithsonian to develop IPM policies that met unique needs of cultural and historical properties. However, it was not until the publication, A Guide to Museum Press Control in 1988 by Zuckerman that IPM, um, that IPM or Integrated Pest Management was understood and widely accepted. So we have a poll here. So I'm gonna ask everybody to, um, is, is the poll up and going? Yay. So if you feel, please answer the poll and then we'll talk about it in a second. Okay, so I, as the poll is rolling in, let me discuss some results of the poll. About 80% um, say that you have an integrated pest management program. Well, great. I'm hoping that you know some of what we talk about will help you actually enhance that pest management program. However, 20% 20, uh, 20 of you said you didn't have an integrated pest management program. Well, welcome. I'm really glad that you are here. And this is a great place to start. Um, and it looks like of those of you who have an integrated pest management program that about a little over 50% of you, 53% of you have written policy and procedure. That's really important. And um, we can discuss that, and, you know, like why it's important. It gets buy-in. It gives you a way in which you can then say, hey, maybe we don't eat in these areas. So it's not you saying that to someone, but it's the policy, it's agreed upon rules by everyone else. It looks like uh, over 70% of you, 73% of you um, inspect for pests, excellent. That's a great thing to be doing is monitoring and inspecting. And about 80% of you monitor with traps. So there's different types of traps that will capture pests and that way you know what's going on in your building. I'm not sure if I could share the results. Can you guys see the 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 um, poll? Can you see it now? All right, I'll stop sharing. Can everybody hear me still? Yes. Okay. Sorry, it's it. I can't see any of the participants. So sometimes Zoom is like talking into a void. All right. So. I wrote a book, so part of it is it was created with the support of North Central IPM Center Green Shield and the, Inst the IPM Institute of North America. Integrated Pest Management or IPM is, isn't a rigid scientific term for instant pest, pest control. Integrated Pest Management, think of it as a lifestyle. It offers a toolbox of cultural, mechanical, and physical strategies to control pests. 
by inspecting for pests, which it looks like 70% of you are already doing, hooray, and signs for pest, monitoring potential infestation, so that's looking at traps, and removing pest conductive conditions, and proactively excluding or keeping pests from your building through proper maintenance. It is possible to safely and effectively protect and maintain your museum's collection, you know, your museum's collections without relying on pesticides. There are four key areas of into, you know, for integrated pest management success. So essentially inspection. So find something, you know, if you find something that you're concerned about, you may find a piece that may have a bug on it or it has a little bit of dirt or it looks suspicious, you know, isolate the piece. So bag it, look around, see if there's other pest activity, see what's going on in the area, do a little bit of detective work. It's one of the things I really like about IPM. There's a science to it. There's a detective aspect to it. It's just really, you know, like I just really find it super fascinating. Okay, so the second step is monitoring. So how do I know if I have any pests? Well-placed monitors can tell you quite a bit. So that's where we sometimes can put in insect traps. And I don't put it down a whole lot in my museum and I have a pretty active program. So that's often a question that I get asked is how many traps? Well, it really depends on how many you can reasonably check. And so sometimes you may wanna put them in areas that you're most concerned about. In your home, you may be concerned in the kitchen, but in your museum spaces, you may be concerned more in storage where you keep most of your artifacts or maybe up on display or a display area where you have some loaned items. You wanna make sure that the space is clean and well cared for. And then step three is sanitation. If nothing else, if you don't do anything else, you don't inspect, you don't monitor, if you just clean up a bit, you are already doing IPM. So those of you today who came in and said, oh, I'm not really doing IPM. If you've ever cleaned up, decluttered, gotten rid of those extra boxes, boy, we in museums like to just keep extra boxes around a lot. Those are all areas where pests can um, aggregate or come into. So just cleaning up is really important. It's also really important to use a HEPA vacuum um, because it actually filters out a lot of mold spores and dust pretty effectively. If you're not using HEPA vacuum quite frequently, that can re-aerosolize dust. So you're spending all this time vacuuming to then push all of that dust back into the air. And then if nothing else helps, so step four is keep the pests out in the, in the first place. So I'm one of these pest management people that is all about pests are really pests only do by locality. I mean, we may not like cockroaches, but they are really important to the food web. But they're really, you really don't want them in your building. So if you keep them out of your building, the same thing with mice or bats, you may not want them in your building. Um, so if you push them out of your building, then they're in the natural environment, they're doing their job. So integrated pest management is teamwork. And without teamwork, your integrated pest management program will fail. And so um, you need to build buy-in. And some of that is educating people, talking to people. In the chat later, I will put up a, um, a really nice um, chart um, how to get different levels of staff involved in your integrated pest management program and how to create buy-in. I think that most people don't wanna use a lot of chemicals anymore. So you can also say, hey, if, you know, if we're doing this type of thing, we're not using as many chemicals, we're being more environmentally friendly. So you may have your hippy dippy staff member that likes to hear all about using less chemicals. Maybe you have a super neat Nick staff member that really likes to keep things clean. Integrated pest management is all about decluttering, organizing and keeping things clean. So you also create the policy with your administration. I'll also be including later on in the chat, um, my, you know, like my, integrated pest management policy, it's super short. And it's really about asking people to help participate in the program. If you see something, if you see an abnormal condition like a leaky pipe or something smells weird, or you see a pest, like we have these little, tra you know, catch traps for staff to go and catch, um, you know, to catch pests if they so desire, or they can photograph pets, you know, photograph them and let us know about them. But the main core people or person in your integrated pest management program is your janitor or your building service worker as they are called on this campus. Your janitor knows everything in your building. They know who's doing what, where, and 
and also just making sure that they are appreciated, that they will be your first line of defense. They're going to know and they're going to see problems sooner than anyone else. So also, I can't do integrated pest management without my building service worker, Jimmy Hudson, who's amazing. Um, my collections team is responsible for doing integrated pest management at the museum, as is every other team member. We all have an integrated pest management agreement that the staff signs, that we only eat in certain areas of the museum, that, you know, we, you know, that we agree to clean up after ourselves. And, you know, we all have bad roommates, so some people don't clean up after each other. So sometimes it means that somebody else, each week, one section of the museum is assigned you know, this was pre-COVID for cleaning the lunchroom and everything else. People are a lot cleaner post-COVID or not, well, during COVID. Um, so I'm hoping that that trend stays afterwards. And also I have integrated pest management students, undergraduates that work for me that help me put together um, the, the, these materials. So um, pest reduction, again, goes into these four core steps. Now, this is actually going into a little bit more detail. And I'm a person who is neurodivergent, so I'm a visual learner. So that's why a lot of um, these types of diagrams and everything that's present in my book, which is free for download, and we'll talk about that at the end, has these type of infographics. So you can easily look at, what am I doing? Am I doing the inspection part, which I'm looking for signs, which are pests, signs of pests and pest conductive conditions? Am I monitoring? Am I using traps? What kind of traps am I using? Am I keeping records on those traps? Sanitation, I'm remove, you know, I'm looking at where am I keeping my food, my water, my waste, and other things. And am I doing good housekeeping all the over the place? And am I really looking at my building? Am I doing routine or am I making sure my museum or building has routine maintenance? Are there pest proofing? Are we sealing openings? So proper success is the foundation of any, you know, like it's the start of your IPM program. So generally, some of the most important inspection tools are a flashlight and a magnification device. Also, gloves are helpful if you're a little freaked out about pests, um, you know, but in this, in this arena of less PPE being available, you know, sometimes you just wash up and everything else like that, and tweezers. So essentially you want to inspect the area around the artifact, inspect most vulnerable artifacts and those that offer food and shelter. So sometimes we have a lot of food baskets in our museum and they still have food residue in them and they have lots of nooks and crannies and that tends to be where pests tend to congregate. And so you can also look at different types of materials. Maybe you have a lot of leather pieces or a lot of wooden pieces and you notice something is having a problem in one area. So you may just wanna to continue to look in those areas and kind of note it down and return. Inspect the entire, an, you, know, a, you know, if you can inspect the entire building annually for preventative maintenance, such as leak, damaged doors, et cetera. And then you can also check construction and renovation. So also, um, Spider webs are really, really good indicators of where there are leaks and other problems in your buildings, which is why I have this little icon of spiders. So if you see spider webs in certain areas, spiders set up shop where they're going to eat. So they, it's kind of like consider them like a McDonald's or some type of, you know, fast food restaurant. They're going to set up right where they know people are going to pass by. Like that's what a fast food chain does. That's what a spider does. So if you see a lot of webs, realize you may have some insect pests. Um, so if you're keeping everything clean, that's also helping. So if you're able to look at your shelves, wipe them down once a year, that way, if you see something that's different, maybe it's dirty, something's going on that you haven't looked at before. Also shine, use your flashlight to shine in areas, look in dark spaces. Um, and if you can check new artifacts as they arrive. Many museums have short-term external storage, but if you don't have that, which my museum doesn't, um, you know, kind of keep an isolation area as best you can. And one museum that's super clever has used like an actual camping tent as their inspection area. So they bought a camping tent that they could zip up and use inside of their space if they're concerned that something's infested. I thought that was pretty brilliant. Um, so all of these things will help you um, you know, just inspect different layers. We can inspect at the artifact, we, ins we can inspect if we see a sign of pest, we can look around our building, we can see if things are clean, we can kind of note those things and go back and take care of them. 
So let's look at some low hanging fruit. So what can we do? Um, we can exclude, so exclusion, which is a fancy word for like close up holes, make sure that you know pests can't get in. So if you can, door sweeps. So they kind of go at the bottom of doors. Um, we have brush ones here and they have rubber ones. They also have ones that prevent mice that have um, stainless steel on the inside. They are really great tools for preventing pest movement underneath doors. Also, you know, if your administration's like, oh, you know, like I don't see pests, I don't know about them. You know, I don't wanna deal with that. They're expensive, they're not that expensive, but we don't wanna put them in right now. You can also say, all right, well, it's also environmentally friendly. If you're using door seals and sweeps, it means that you're not, you know, losing as much energy. So you're not having thermal gain in the summer, which you guys probably do all the time in Texas, or you know, um, heat loss in your winter season. So using metal and mesh screens. So any of you, if any of you are near um, like an aquatic water area, you may need to use different size screens. If you're in a historic building, you can look at that. And then there are repellent products. So I did realize Leslie sent me some questions that you guys had before this session. And I do have a repellent product that I really, really like that I've been using that's not a pesticide. And it's like, it reduced our pests by like 38% on the outside of our building. It was pretty awesome. Um, so I will put that in the chat when I end the PowerPoint. So cleaning, do good housekeeping, reduce clutter, remove dust, remove your trash, and vacuum. So if you can do those things, excellent. Get rid of boxes, declutter. The easy, you know, the cleaner things are, the less clutter they are, the easier it is for you to just go through and do a quick inspection. Cultural changes you can also make are, in our museum, we don't allow any live plants because they are areas where you can have pests. Now, in some museums, they may have fresh cut flowers, and that's part of their you know, that's part of what you do as a cultural institution, well, then maybe that rule isn't for you. But hopefully you can have any food trash can should have a lid. That is really important. That does keep pests out. Um, limit food when you can to certain places. And of course, be friends with your janitor. So step two, monitoring. Effective integrated pest management requires a lot, you know, constant surveillance of your museum for pest intruders. Well, wow, that sounds like a lot. And we all have many, many hats that we wear, but it's not possible to observe every corner of your facility every second of the day. Simple monitoring tools such as traps or pheromone lures make this task a little bit more manageable. Traps can be set around your museum to track insect populations in troubled areas. But how many? I mean, I generally say as many as you can check regularly once a month. More isn't better here because we all wear different hats and we all are super busy. So I usually say to people when I'm teaching workshops, which I'm teaching you today, if you have one pest trap that you regularly check and look at it and really are monitoring and being, you know, like analyzing and evaluating that, that's great. That's better than having 20 traps that you don't check that often and you're really not paying attention to. Where? Well, in storage, if you can place it nearer to your vulnerable artifacts, if it's an exhibit in a public area with lots of traffic. I know, like they have different pest traps that aren't like, you know, like I know some of them are not very attractive and the, and the um, public does not look like, like looking at pest traps. They have some that are more covered so that they look like old VHS. Um, you know, like cases, for those of you who are old enough to know what those are, those are a little bit less intrusive than some of these triangular traps. And then against walls and in corners or in any area that's a little bit dark. So here's a decision-making flow chart. We don't need to, you know, essentially the theme is, you know, so questions you can ask yourself are, are pests present? Okay, well, do they pre present an immediate danger to staff or visitors? Now let's define that. In the, uh, the only pests that I react to absolutely immediately are um, stinging insects. And I think in Texas, you have a lot more, a lot more <laughs> stinging insects than we do in Illinois. But often if we have something um, like a, you know, a wasp nest or something setting up, we do deal with that immediately in our museum. We had a wasp nest that was getting set up near our front door and we were having a bunch of school kids come in. Well, you know, people can die from wasp and bee stings. So that is something that needs to be taken care of immediately. If it is a honeybee, 
um, you know, situation, often you can get someone who will relocate the hive because we do want our pollinators. Um, if it's um, something that does present a danger to people, you can get your pest management company to deal with it immediately. Are the pests damaging your collections? You know, um, and then do the pests breed indoor or outdoor? Are there obvious entrants for the pests? And essentially, so the, it's like, are pests present? No, continue monitoring. Are they immediate threat to staff or visitors? Yes, follow emergency procedures. No, are, there, are they damaging your collection? If the answer is no, you'll see in this flow chart, I always say continue monitoring. And if there are obvious entrances for the pests, then seal those up, look for that. If not, and you're still you're not figuring it out, then maybe add a trap so you can see what's going on and you can maybe do a little bit more detective work there. So are pests feeding on a single food source? If you can, you know, are they confined to a single area? So if you continue to kind of go through this flow chart, which is in my book, it's available to you, that kind of gives you an idea of, okay, what do I do next? What do I do next? But in the end, it's really always monitoring. You're always kind of keeping, you know, in the back burner, kind of knowing what's going on in your facility. All right, so step two, monitoring. Can we have the pull up, please? Ah, here we go. All right, well, let me like share some of the results. Does your museum um, or institution monitor for um, temperature and relative humidity? Well, most of you said yes, they do. And that's great if you're able to do that. At times, temperature and relative humidity can tell you a little bit about like, is it dangerous for you know my artifacts? It, you know, sometimes if you the higher the temperature. I mean, you know this, you guys live in Texas, the more pests or insect activity you have than in colder climates. So I teach in Canada and in Canada, they don't have nearly as many pests as they do in Texas, for instance, because it's a lot colder there. Um, for those of you who aren't monitoring, sometimes it's also just being aware and there's computer programs that you can look at what is the temperature at least outside. Um, you may have ways in which if you need to not monitor all the time, just realize that if it's hotter, quite often you're gonna have more pest activity and if it's colder, also you can do your own kind of human gauge temperature. Is my building feeling a little bit hot? Do I feel like the, you know, things are going wrong in my building? Do I feel like my air conditioner is working? Does your museum regularly clean the inside of exhibit cases? Well, um, about 41% of you said yes, that's a pretty big number. Um, most of the time when I ask museums, most people don't do that because it requires a lot of work. And no, um, we generally try, and about 59% of you said no. Um, and generally at my museum, and we tend to have, you know, we're, we're university museums, so we have a lot of undergraduate labor. We try and get to at least one gallery every summer. And in COVID, we were able to, because my full-time staff, not my student staff, were able to be here, we were able to do some deep cleaning during COVID. But generally, even we, and I have a great IPM program, we can't always get to everything. So essentially, the more you're vacuuming and cleaning, the less pest conductive conditions you have. And then um, do you regularly vacuum and clean around storage units? Excellent. I'm really excited to see that, uh, you know, that over 60% of you have done that. And then um, about 35 or you said 35% of you said no. Well, I mean, we all wear um, a lot of hats and sometimes we can't get to everything. Um, however, so, you know, as I said, as temperature rises, insect activity increases. 
And as temperature lowers, there's less insect activity. Sometimes you also may find at the change of seasons, you may see more pests coming into your building in Illinois. I know right at the fall when it starts getting a little bit chilly, we may have mice pushing, pushing into our offsite facility because they wanna go where it's warm. And they maybe can feel some warm areas and, and so they're trying to get in. Um, also, you can monitor, if you don't monitor for temperature and relative humidity, we can all monitor for clutter. We can walk around, we all have that office mate or that one person who has way too much stuff and keeps all of the boxes. If there's a lot of clutter, the more clutter you have, the more likely you're gonna have pest activity. And often it's a, a lot harder to clean. So sanitation. So everything living needs food, water, and shelter to survive. Improving sanitation reduces access to food and leaves your museum as inhospitable to pests. Your museum's first line of defense should always be a trusty vacuum cleaner. Basically, the cleaning bonuses are one, it's cleaner. And I think in COVID land, we've all learned that cleaner is much, you know, is we're less likely to get sick. I think flu influenza has been at all time low. So maybe we'll all keep up with this cleaning. Um, and as I said, when we did a deep clean of our museum, um, we reduced our domestic population by 80%. So we did a deep clean where we actually vacuumed near the moldings. We did, we did a really great vacuum all around the edges of rooms. We had every staff member dust their office with Swiffers, clean up and throw everything out. I brought donuts, which is of course not you know, for pests, but for people. So we made sure to clean um, windowsills, edge molding, anywhere where food can be present. Also empty your vacuum bag contents daily if you can, um, or place them in a sealed bag, you know, limit food sources and, um, you know, limit where you have events and parties. So when we notice that every time we do a deep clean, we drop our pest load by 80%. And I've been tracking pests in my building now for about 21 years. And after we do the deep clean, all the pests drop. And like I said, the Dermestids, which attack our collections, actually drop by 80%, 80. Okay, last poll. Well, all right. It looks like, do you regularly go into your mechanical rooms? Um, so many of your pests, like cockroaches and things like that, come out of your drains in your mechanical rooms. And your mechanical rooms, if you're not looking at them, quite frequently are pretty porous and will allow pests to enter your museum. Um, I check my mechanical room about once a week. Um, we're in our mechanical rooms quite often, um, but I also have a pest management student that helps me clean it up. We actually vacuum our mechanical rooms. Um, but do go in there, look and see, are the drains dry? They are a, they do bring in a lot of pests. And also, would you be able to identify building maintenance issues? Well, wow, about 75% of you said yes, you could. For those of you who didn't, um, I'm going to stop sharing now. The poll is that when we start thinking about when I started in the museum field, I really was thinking about the artifact. And that's what I was trained to think about was the artifact and sometimes the storage enclosure around it. And then sometimes the, you know, the environment itself, you know, like the exhibit cases, light and that kind of thing. But I found over 30 years of being in this business that I really need to know a lot more about my building. And you all in Texas just went through Snowmageddon. So I'm sure that you, your buildings were pushed and your buildings were pushed hard. And you probably learned things about your building that you never knew before. So I generally will go outside with my staff when it's poor, like, so we have rain that kind of goes sideways in Illinois and I wanna see what's happening to my building. So I'll go out at night, like go out and look at, are the, are the gutters draining properly? Like what is my building doing in different seasons? What does it look like in the rain? What does it look like at night? Are a lot of insects attracted to the building through my lights? Like I wanna see how my building is being affected. And so 
looking at the artifact, going out to the storage enclosure, then going to the environment around it, the building, and then the climate. So we've talked about this several times. You're in Texas, but in Texas, Texas is humongous. You may have somebody who's near the ocean, somebody who's near a river, somebody who's urban, somebody who's suburban. Each one of these areas, my museum is in a suburban area. However, we have agriculture because we're a huge agriculture college. We happen to have a lot of crops and things like that that are you know, a lot of dust that's brought up from that. So you really need to be thinking about like, what is my area and what kind of pests are coming in because of that area. So you pretty much need to understand what environment you're in. Um, structural pests such as cockroaches are present, like pretty much cockroaches get into any buildings. So here are some ways in which pests enter your building. Most insects prefer dark, tight spaces, sealing cracks and crevices in your building envelope is basically saying, you know, seal up your building is the equivalent of posting a large eviction notice for these intruders. Poor maintenance of your building will draw more pests to your, to your museum or historic center. External light, standing water and vegetation on or close to your building's perimeter will attract pests. Positioning exterior lights to shine away from entryways, installing gutter systems to carry water away, keeping vegetation uh, buffer around your building will deter pests from getting too close. So you'll see at right here on the right side of the slide, that is my inorganic barrier that I have around my building, which you can see a few weeds in it. So how I look at the building is I look at from the basically the ground up. So the surrounding environment, am I aquatic? Am I suburban? Am I urban? Then what does my foundation look like? You know, um, what is my exterior walls, doors, light? Like light is part of your building that you need to consider. Ease, roofs, protruding elements. How are we removing water from it? And then the interior and then the artifact itself. So there are just multiple levels of protections to consider when protecting your artifacts. Um, so you, you want to look at, you know, if you can't do all of these things and maybe that's outside of your control, maybe you can close your artifacts into um, enclosures. Perhaps you can put a door sweep in your storage. If you can't control, maybe you have a leaky roof or you don't have enough money to be dealing with certain things. There's ways in which maybe you can do something on a smaller scale from the artifact side. But as people who take care of collections, we need to be building aware. And it's also important to quarantine and inspect new acquisitions and treat them respect, you know, respectively before integrating them into your collection. So, a lot of times people get really hung up on what's on their pest trap. And um, you can, you know, find you know, there's about maybe 20 kind of pests that we generally need to be concerned about for most heritage collections. But some of these pests are telling you something. So if you guys see a cricket and somebody asked about the cricket migration, um, crickets, they're big. So if you're getting crickets, they can't live in your building, really. They don't live well in structures. So if they're getting in, it means you got a big hole. So that's like telling you, I got a hole. And also they're attracted to light, they're photophilic. So they see light coming out from your museum and they go to that light. So it shows you, you have light bleed and you have a big hole. Ground beetles, also same thing, large openings. House centipedes like moisture. Sosids or book lice like mold and moisture. So if you're seeing like, you know, book lice, it means you have a mold problem. Spider webs, usually in weak, like they're telling you that you have places you need to seal. They are telling you you have a pest problem. And then drain flies um, tell you that you have dry drains. That would be something that would be coming out of your mechanical rooms or maybe in some of your restrooms. There are these little flies that have these little round fuzzy wings and they, um, drain flies is a polite way to say it. They're coming out of the sewer, they're sewer flies. And so it's telling you, you have a dry drain. So. Another way in which you can look at is look for the formula of uh, your pest potential. So do I have pest access, cracks, gaps, building openings? Okay, if I've got those, plus I have food, water, and clutter, I have bigger pest potential. So how do I reduce that? I can take away any of these to reduce my pest condition, you know, like pest conductive conditions. I can solve leaks. I can 
empty mop water. I can make sure that the dishes are done in the sink or that somebody puts them away. We can package human food so that they're not laying out all over the place. We can also clean up bugs. We tend to get these um, cluster flies for whatever reason in the late winter um, that overwinter and then fall dead all over my museum. It's highly attractive, um, but we have to keep those continuously swept up because the pests that eat our collection also eat those flies, then they spread. Also getting rid of cardboard boxes, getting rid of clutter, and then choosing to um, limit the access. So this is basically showing you that how you can look at the pest potential is, how is your IPM performance? Do you have policy? Krista, can I just interrupt just real sure. quick before you get too deep into this slide? Mikey yes. had a question for you. Is there any particular issue to be aware of or a specific way to treat case moths? Oh, uh, case making clothes moths. Excellent. Um, probably what you need to do is you probably need to start looking at where are they coming from? Quite frequently, case making clothes moths often come in because sometimes they're not coming in on your object. Sometimes it may be that you have like pigeons or you have other birds infesting outside or sometimes mice and other things. They get into those nests and then come into your building. So I guess I would ask Mike, is it on your artifacts or are you just kind of seeing them around? If you're seeing them around your artifacts, start isolating a lot of your proteinaceous materials like your wools, you know, like your skin, start watching those. And then there are types of pheromone traps that will bring the males in. There's also light traps where you can start monitoring and seeing like, where's the problem there? And then they actually, you know, so you can start looking at those types of things. I hope that answers the question a little bit. Yes, it does. Thank you. Excellent. All right. So we, this is just talking about, and this is in my book, how well is your pest, like your IPM performance? Do you have a policy? You know, do you have buy-in with your staff, for instance? Have you um, considered your environment? What's the climate? It, you know, when are you getting pests? Does your building, you know, what does your building look like? Do you have lights? Like, this is just going through in a different way each time, just saying, like, have you, like, where are your artifact stores? Are they in a container? Is it isolated? Do they have access? And then, like, what are the pest hazards? What's the damage? Are materials being eaten? Are the artifacts still displayable? So it's looking at how do you, how do you see, you know, like the artifacts and what barriers around them to notice? So this is kind of giving you prompts to help provide, to basically walk you through your own pest management program. So sometimes we as collections people, ugh, I don't know anything about pests. Maybe I don't know about my building, that's okay. So the most important thing to do is sometimes you may not know anything about those things, but you know about your artifact. So you may know, what is my artifact made of? Okay, it's material. So. Then I know, is it edible? Meaning, is it something that's made out of something to eat? Like if it's glass or ceramic, it's inedible. We don't have to freak out about it. But if it's edible and like Mike said, oh, you know, I may have some stuff that webbing clothes moss may be attacking. Maybe you start looking at your edible or unedible collections. You also look at condition. Artifacts that have been previously infested generally may get infested again, but you don't need to panic. Um, you don't need to start spraying. You basically, you do have time. Your, your first job is to isolate your pieces that you do see and vacuum and clean around those areas to stop pests from spreading. So sometimes go with what you know. This is just saying by artifact conditions. So I give you in my book, like, hey, is it made out of animal? Here's some stuff that eats animal. Hey, here's some stuff that eats plants. So for instance, animals, you know, consist of fur, feathers, skin, hair, bones, and horns. I kind of divide it into soft tissue and hard tissue. And then like what eats it from there? It's these types of things that eat those just so you know, but it's generally like, okay, if I'm seeing these, then I know that I may have that type of pest. Again, you know, we have these, which are hard tissue, larder beetles tend to go with that. So it's just mainly like giving you an indication of maybe I know what my thing is made out of, therefore I know the pest. And plants, we talked about silverfish, you know, so there's silverfish, there may be furniture beetles. So this talks about all different types of, you know, like paper is, you know, yellow stains, like what is the residue? What does it look like? It may be silverfish because we know that silverfish, it's kind of like you have friends that are only vegetarians. You have those friends that only eat meat. Maybe you have something in between, but 
you know, it's the same thing for pests. Some pests only eat things that are like cellulosic or made from plants. Some things only eat things that are made from animals. So sometimes that helps you, uh, you know, identify the pests. You can also think of what is your most vulnerable object. And like the listservs are out there to like track down the pest, but who has time for that? Sometimes you need to know, uh, I got bedding. I've got furniture, it may have horse hair on the inside of it, you know, I may have wool sweaters, you know, essentially, um, you know, the most artful, most vulnerable artifacts that those that offer food and shelter to pests, including organic materials such as leather, cloth, wood, um, you know, any of these pieces I said here in this slide, inspection once a year, if you can do that is great um, for vulnerable artifacts on display or well organized clutterfully dry secure storage if you're able to do that the least vulnerable artifacts are organic materials like metal and stone and pottery they may they maybe inspect those once every several years so if you don't have enough time inspect the stuff that tends to have problems first there are more options available to you once you've located your infested objects then you know i always need to go back to you know collection a because collection a is always getting infested there's low cost items like freezing you know, sometimes solar bagging can be done if you want to do heating. So it's basically putting your stuff in a bag in the sun. Both freezing and heating can affect your artifacts. They can accelerate, you know, deterioration, but you have to weigh out those risks. Is it, are the pests eating them going to actually, you know, um, deteriorate the object a lot faster than maybe taking the risk of heating or cooling? Um, so you may want to get a conservator involved at that point. So you don't need to inspect all your artifacts daily monitor 500 different traps and keep every inch of your museum spotless and seal every crack in your museum to practice IPM. That level of IPM is not necessary. It's not even possible. The best thing you can do is stay calm and choose the IAPM level that is right for you. And now we have, I have time for questions. I'm going to stop the share. And I am going to put in, you guys had a couple questions already, and I'm going to see if I can put in some of the things that you all were asking about. So do we have any questions? Not yet. All right. Well, let me talk about building buy-in. Because you know, heck, I have a I have a program. I need to build buy-in. You know, how do I do that? Um, okay. Well, first, here is the here is the link um, to get my book for free. So um, you just have to fill out a couple of um, points of like where are you from and that kind of thing because that's that is the um, the agreement that I had with the granting agency was to, um, you know, basically collect that information. But all of these slides were, um, you know, developed for um, a book, and um, all of this information is available to you for free. Let me give you. So this is a a checklist um, that is on the museum pests site. And it is for creating buy-in. So it's basically going through like, how is it important to your administration? How is, you know, um, like, how would you, you know, like, how do you, how do you get your administrator to have buy-in? How do you get your educators to have buy-in? So it kind of talks about what's in it for them. You know, how can you help them to get part of your program? So let me see what else you guys asked. There was a, an additional question, Krista. Sure. Um, is, do you have a particular pheromone trap or brand that you prefer in, in using? I think it depends on the type of um, the type of insect that we're trying to deal with. Um, Insects Limited, um, you know, does very specific, you know, types of pheromones, but you may have your pest management company may have some of those. If you're like, hey, I need webbing clothes moss stuff, they may have those, um, you know, if you're working with somebody like that and then you just judiciously put them up. Pheromone traps are pretty expensive. So you want to like make sure that you're like, okay, I definitely need them because they can also pull non-target. Like if you don't have them, they'll start pulling them in. Pheromones are strong things. So they only pull in the male insects. So the insects, the female insects are still laying eggs and, you know, doing their thing. Um, so, but 
I tend to like, you know, I, I've gone with insects limited ones. I've gone with some things that my pest management professionals, you know, have as well. Um, let me, so I, I think I put, let me see if I could put my policy in the chat. And then I had my repellent because that was one of the questions that your group had as well. Krista, just make sure that you put it for all panelists and attendees so everyone can see okay. it. Okay. Oh, sorry. Ah, okay. I'm not used to this whole new webinar format, everyone. I apologize. This one should work. So this is my pest. This is my environmental policy, and um, and you got my book. And this is the repellent that I really like, um, that I that I use around the museum. And it smells like um, what is it? Mint root beer. It's, it smells quite awful, but it is. Um, it's basically a, um, it's not a pesticide, but you'll see insects run. So what we do is we put it around the museum. And because I do my research tracking pests, it reduces our pest by like 38% when we spread it around the outside of a building. You get one of those like, like little like, you know, things that you would spread for grass seeds. You kind of like spin it and you walk around the museum and it smells like it's peppermint root beer is what it smells like. So it's like corn with like thyme oil on it and stuff. So it's kind of stinky, but it's not a pesticide, but it's a repellent. And also if you have your inorganic barrier around your building, that's quite excellent. Is the um, smell part of the repellent well, it is of the, Yeah, it's part of it. It's really interesting. As I'm walking around the building, like you'll see the spiders go, woo, like they just run. And it's like the insects, like you put it down on the ground and then you just see them like bolting. And it's not just that stuff's dropping, it's just the stink. And how long know, does that stink last? Um, well, it depends. If you guys get a lot of rain, you want to do it when it's not rainy. Like, so you want to like put it down and then like let it last out there a week and like kind of get going. But unfortunately, sometimes when I put it down, then it like rains later that afternoon and I'm like, sigh. Okay, so I got to put it down again. Um, so I really like that repellent. And I think that I got the buy in. I gave you guys my book thing. Um, and then we had some other questions as well. Um, are there other questions coming up? It said, um, so, yet. so it basically talked about should wooden African masks with an infestation be frozen? Okay, so that was one of your questions you sent me. And I would say it depends on the mask. It depends on what's on the mask. So if it's something where it has ivory on it, for instance, or something that freezing could actually cause it to like kind of blow off of it or do something like that, then probably no. But if it's something where it's really getting eaten and it's going to become unusable, maybe you take the risk and you say, okay, the only thing I could do is freeze it. Um, solar bagging, um, I don't have that article up, is a way in which you take a black trash bag and you put your stuff in it and then you put it out in the sun, which I know you all have in Texas, where you heat up the bag, like you heat the thing up inside. I generally tell this for students, like, so, you know, we have college students and sometimes they get bed bugs. So I'm like, take your suitcase, put it in your car in the summer and like, you know, your car gets hot, let it heat up in your car. And that's like a way of dealing with your suitcase and everything else. But, you know, heating stuff actually accelerates deterioration. So you also have to weigh out that risk as well. So I think I answered getting people on board, Pat, you know, like um, IPM policy. My policy is pretty short and slippery, I think it'll slip right in to some existing things, unless it's like, we will eat everywhere. Um, and, you know, we will lick all the artifacts. Like, I think it's pretty basic, but in some cases, like people are like, oh, well, you say no flowers. In my institution, that works. In other institutions, it may not. You and know, so the question, um, yeah. what is a good way to block up holes under a door if your door sweep isn't working? Get another door sweep. Um, see about like, there's this, I forgot what it's called. There's like an under, like there's the under part of the door and then there's the top part of the door that fits it. See if your door is out of whack. Like we have a soft loading dock that sometimes gets so hot that it kind of twists. So it may be that your door is the problem as well. Um, you know, also in Texas, you may be able to use what's called an air curtain. So like when you walk in a grocery store and you feel that puff of air and you're like, what is that? It's because flies don't like it. They don't like air. It like freaks them out. And they're like, no, it's like petting a cat the wrong way. You're like, nope. So air curtains often work. So when I've advised historical museums who can't use a lot of these devices, I'm like, put an air curtain in because that will blow down. 
and you could kind of paint it like in that way, you know, you can not have screens and everything that weren't historically accurate. Uh, Jennifer um, has a question. Um, she says that we have pigeons outside. What can I do to deter them? Okay, so to deter pigeons, you can use, um, it sounds really awful. There's this stuff called bird spike. Well, we're not gonna freak out about bird spike. What it is, it's kind of like, would you rather sit on a cushion that's like super squishy or would you rather sit on a cushion that has a bunch of tacks on it? That's what bird spike is. It's kind of like these little spikes that kind of make it you know, unhospitable. So birds have places where they nest and birds have places where they loaf. So it's kind of like, consider that your pre-COVID coffee shop like my museum was the pre-COVID coffee shop because the gutters like kind of ran into each other and there was this little pool of water and all of these pigeons would loaf right at our front door and then crap on people, which is really not cool. Like people do not want to be pooped on like in general when they're entering a museum. So we had to like redo our gutters because we couldn't put spike there. So there's different types of things like maybe some mechanical things. There's also a thing called bird shock. Let's not freak out about bird shock. Bird shock is kind of like a little, a like, kind of like when your little brother used to run around on the carpet and then zap you. It's kind of a static shock and it just is annoying. Birds need to be basically harassed off of places. So it's kind of like, you're like, okay, you've been in this coffee shop long enough. You've loafed here, you've hung out, move on. Also, if you do, um, you trim your trees about 20%, if you prune them up at least 20%, they will move. So generally, if you have a lot of birds congregating, if you trim up your trees more, they'll go to a place where there's more branches. So that also helps you. So really, you just want to get them off your building. It's kind of somebody else's problem. I'm sorry, but that's also what you can do as well. So um, we're almost coming up to time. Is there any other questions? But please feel free to download my book. It's free and it has all these charts and, you know, and it has pests in there and everything else. And, um, you know, pretty much if you're cleaning something up and you've thrown out a box and you've looked at your building, you're doing IPM. Like you can do it. And, you know, I appreciate everybody who's working on programs. And for those of you who are brave enough to come today and you don't have a program yet, Go throw something out, go clean up somebody like your desk. Bam, you've done IPM. Good going you. So. Okay, great. Well, uh, on behalf of Tam, I want to thank Krista and Leslie for this uh, very informative presentation and very timely as those bugs are starting to emerge. <laughs> after that snowpocalypse. Um, right. <laughs> in closing, I'd also like to thank you for attending today's event. Uh, the presentation and Krista's info will be included in a follow-up email. And I you think you're also posting my book, aren't you? Like yes. on my website, my link, thank you. Yes, we'll, we'll get a link to that. So, but capture it here as well so that you can, you don't have to wait. Um, if you enjoyed today's event and you are not a member of the Texas Association of Museums, please consider becoming one and then joining the Collections Managers Committee. We have a whole lot of new um, membership options and it's only $10 add-on to, uh, to connect with your fellow collection managers. With that, I want to say thank you and stay healthy out there. Goodbye. All right. Thank you, everybody. Do you need me to stay on or are we okay? We're all good. All right, thank you guys, I appreciate you all. Bye.